So, so yeah, so, all right, so today we're here with uh, educators and, and uh, faculty from Western Connecticut State University, particularly the uh, Center for Creativity, Compassion, and Innovation. And we're gonna discuss what crowdfunding could potentially do for the university, and we're gonna kinda go through a little consultative session to determine what your needs are and, and how, how we could work together to try to help you guys meet your needs uh, through crowdfunding. So I guess, uh, after our first meeting, which area were you guys thinking that you guys could use crowdfunding in? Like what, what areas in particular were, were you looking to use crowdfunding? Was it mainly to raise money for your center? Is that your number one priority? Yeah, the number one okay. priority is center and the center's projects. Um, the projects range from everything from uh, community projects, such as Lynn just applied for a grant on a homeless project, uh, helping the homeless in the Danbury area, to research to research projects that, that we are undertaking and, and doing. Okay. So, uh, you know, those are the two major areas of projects that we'd be looking at because we'd like to, for the center to be both a resource and a research hub, not just locally, but nationally and internationally as well for compassion, creativity, and innovation. Excellent. Okay. So there's, so it seems like there's a lot of fundraising capabilities for crowdfunding. And I think there's a couple ways you guys can potentially do it. You can either try to incorporate your own sort of funding mechanism through crowdfunding into the university, or you can use an existing platform and just run campaigns that way. Meaning that uh, that probably be the cheapest option. If you um, if you wanted to integrate your own funding portal into the actual university and make that part of the university where you kind of cut out the middlemen, like any of the fees that these normal portals will charge you will now not be associated. I see. Um, you know, that's the benefit, but to actually implement this, you have to have like a monthly fee for this, for this software. You might have to do some custom website design to make it part of the university. So depending on which angle you want to go to, you could, you'll could, you have to spend more up front on the actual proprietary portal that would be attached to the university as opposed to a place like donorschoose.org which is specifically for education. They've raised about 285 million, I think, for educators worldwide, and there's, they, they say something about 51% of their, 51% um, of teachers use donorschoose.org. So in America, 51% of teachers have, have been on it or used it. All right, so um, on that, we have to talk to our IT Mm -hmm. Department about like, even the feasibility of option number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess what we can do is start looking at what we can do with option number two while we contact our own ID department about the feasib feasibility of option one. Because, yeah. <coughs> see, the, the great thing about donorschoose.org is I think it's .org, I don't know if I said .com or .org. They're also a 501c3, so they would, it would be a donation I see. for. A write-off, so that's an incentive in some cases too. Okay, that's a big incentive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so option one would be you're right, more IT intensive and more fixed fee intensive monthly yeah. fee. Um, option two is not much startup. You know, you, you could just post your project immediately, but you wouldn't want to do it that way because you want to run a campaign. If you if you post it on there tomorrow and you click launch, no one's gonna know that you're even doing it. So the whole point of crowdfunding is the campaign piece that happens before you actually begin raising the money. So with Helen's expertise at, at event planning and, and coordination, you guys would need to really come up with a plan that would probably be three months in the making from the moment, so like if this is day one, then you would wanna come up with a plan three months before you actually hit the button to make sure that you have all the pieces in place. Um, because you gotta think of it almost as a political campaign, so to speak. So you you know, it's like, you have your communications plan, mm -hmm. you have your enlistment of your crowdfunding team, who's gonna be in charge of social media, who's gonna be in charge of PR, who's gonna be in charge of events, if that's, if you incorporate events into your fundraising. Um, who's going to be your video team. Mm. 
and um, a lot to think about. It, there is a lot. So like a lot of people, I mean, then again, it, it all depends too. You also want to assess how strong is my traditional network, how strong is my current social network. And really traditional network wise, you guys probably have a very big advantage because you're a university. So you could potentially enlist the already established networks you have through the university channels to really promote whatever you guys are going to do. Because in my opinion, the, the success of crowdfunding initially is started by your traditional networks. The, the, the statistics show that if you raise 30% of your funding goal within the first week, you have a 90% chance to raise the rest of it. And the reason being is because you've done the legwork to get commitments basically on day one, like all your friends, all your family, all the faculty, all the students, basically everyone knows about it, and then the first week they're like, bam, huge rush of funds. Um, success breeds success. Right, that's yeah. a bandwagon thing. Like, oh, people are giving to that. I'm going to give to that too. It's the yeah. yeah. It's like the they call it the herd mentality. It works yeah. even in like the stock market. You know, something. True. Yeah. You know. um, and so that that's why that that's a critical, that's critical. And and unless you have a really really strong network, it usually that's why we say three months is probably a good time to really plan that. Um, but what is your timeline to raise funds at this point? Do you need those? I mean, obviously you want the funds as soon as possible. Everyone wants the funds now. But realistically, how much time do you guys think you have to? We have some flexibility. Um, okay. We, we we're fortunate because um, the Dalai Lama had given us seed money. Oh, that's amazing. So we we have some flexibility with that. And then a number of the local businessmen uh, around the Danbury area have also donated money so that we you know, can get the center up and running and, and moving in a direction. So we have some flexibility on that. But listening to you, you know, Helen, Lynn, and Peggy, and a number of other people who have been part of planning out events leading up to our big conference in October. We have a big Compassion and Creativity conference coming up October 10th and 11th. And Helen and Lynn and uh, other person uh, named Peggy have been crucial setting up even possible dinners and an art show uh, that will be happening like around June. So we have kind of events planned before the events to kind of get the major event uh, of our conference up and running uh, in October. So uh, we've kind of already, just because of the people and the way they work, like Helen in event planning, they kind of set the dominoes up so that things are moving. So we can, I think, be flexible enough and to join in any one of the dominoes that either Helen or Peggy or someone set up or Lynn that we can then, you know, start knocking down the dominoes uh, for, for that company. And you know what, what, what we're trying to do too, on, uh, on March 3rd, we, uh, we're going to DC and we're doing a mock show panel discussion for Reality Crowd TV. And the way we're setting up is we're having entrepreneurs come and they're pitching their ideas to kind of the crowd. I'm moderating and then we're, we're bringing those two entrepreneurs to our expert panel to kind of get practical advice on how to crowdfund better or how to plan, kind of what, they, these people are starting exactly where you are actually. They've never really heard of crowdfunding until recently and they, they said, you know, maybe it could work for my business. So they're at your stage of development planning and we're giving them practical advice, but the way we're gonna help them at the end is we're gonna have a crowdfunding campaign that's also meant to help us raise money for our show, but we're incorporating the entrepreneur so that everybody wins. They're willing to give, they both have online businesses, they're willing to give a $15 gift certificate as one of our rewards for our crowdfunding campaign, and, but we're gonna charge $25 for a $15 coupon so that we're helping the entrepreneurs and then the audience can also help Reality Crowd TV raise money. So if you guys think of how you can incorporate something like that into your events, if this October event is, is there gonna be vendors selling things? Is there gonna be potential people that can give a reward at the no, end or we, something? We, we haven't done that. We've had two smaller events. Each conference has gotten bigger and bigger. And this one is uh, on the topic of compassion, creativity, and mental health. So it's about helping and connecting resources in the communities and nationally, actually, um, on that specific issue. So it's really the conference is there to, to promote ideas, to offer up what doctors and researchers have come up with with uh, assisting you know a myriad of mental health issues both um, mental health right in terms of promotion of 
mental vitality as well as resolving some mental illnesses. So it's really a, a kind of a big tent on how to move forward on mental health issues. And, and we didn't want you know, vendors in there, we wanted the ideas per se, and then we wanted to connect people with places. Okay, so can you incorporate, are there any community projects that are mental health related that you guys are working on? Can you incorporate one of your causes mm -hmm. as the crowdfunding campaign at the end? Mm -hmm. that, that could be an idea, because you have an engaged audience who would be there, and if at the end you have like a roll of laptops set up, where it has access to the internet, and the last like the last like piece of the show would be, you know, you you've seen the issues, you see how people struggle. This is what we're doing to try to combat that in our way, and we would appreciate you if you would donate to our to our campaign. And we're I mean one of the things that we're focusing on right now, and Lynn and I are putting together pieces of it is a way to help those caregivers mm. Mm. that. Um, are in the mental health field. Everybody from nursing to social workers to first-line responders to the, the hospital. Um, and one of the workshops that I've come up with and Lynn was helping me fine-tune it is uh, the difference between compassion and empathy. And when you take a compassion perspective, you avoid the burnout that happens when you have empathy. And people call it passion fatigue, but it's a misnomer. And what we've argued and we're showing through science and through especially neuroscience, that when you reframe an issue on mental health and put it in the, under the compassion, your brain fires differently than it, when it fires for empathy. And it's the same part of the brain when you think in compassion that fires when you're in love. Now what happens when you give love? Do you run out of it? Well, or is there, yeah, it keeps growing. But with empathy, you have this takedown. This compassion, it's the same part of your brain. So when you're doing it, you can keep going. And it's its a different shift in perspective that actually will help um, caregivers avoid that. And that's what we're looking, a, a big project that we're working on. It's so funny that you guys mentioned that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you after we, after the thing's over, but I'm, <laughs> I'm dealing with some of my mom right now. So it's like, it's very timely with, with what you guys are saying here. But, um, but yeah, the caregivers especially, especially like the immediate family and, and friends, you know, usually these people in mental health, they, they kind of turn inward, they isolate themselves, and the fact that you guys are doing something for them, that's big. Now, so okay, so we have some ideas. You, you, so you guys have some big events with a lot of people. You guys have a huge audience already in the traditional sphere, it seems. So your, your traditional event planning is your guys' strongest suit, and your, and your traditional networks are your strongest suit. As far as social media goes for the university as a whole, does every department have their own social media channels, or is it just Western only has one channel, or does how does how does that work? I don't know. Well, we um, right at the moment we go through a fairly uh, standard, which is the Facebook page, and the university has one, and everything gets posted through that. Now, some departments may have their own way of uh, sending out information. Uh, the music department does a Twitter feed so that all their students know about uh, concerts and events and deadlines and things like that within the music department. Whether all our departments do that or not, I don't know, because that would be pretty much up to them. The university has the one standard that we use, for instance, when we're closing and things like that. We have people can go to the web page and stuff is disseminated through our standard web page, but we also post to social media okay. at the same time. Um, and I don't, uh, other than different departments taking it upon themselves, there is no conduit through which everyone sends out information at this time. And the center Lynn can talk about. <coughs> we have a Facebook page and we have a Twitter account. Um, we don't have a lot of followers. So. <laughs> So far, no, we don't. <laughs> but, but we, you know, we're working on it. Okay, Facebook, Twitter, and then of course you all have your own personal social media channels too, which ultimately that'll help drive traffic as well. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, um, and I think you mentioned that the university has some a really good audio visual center or something. It, it, the last time we were here, there was some sort of auditorium that you guys had, or there was something that you guys were mentioning was a space where people can use for audio visual. They're trying to create. 
uh, something that's better. They have they have a great faculty uh, that are doing a lot of different things with outside um, the university. For example, Charter Communications and using Charter Studios, and um, we have some great communication faculty that are, that are just taking it to new levels. And here they're trying to do that. They're trying to increase mm -hmm. the capacity on campus for that right now. So they, they're in the middle of doing that. Okay. I, I ask because being a university and having so many students and so many faculty members, you likely will not have to pay anyone for all of these services that you need. Like video, you have, well like you said, video you have a handle. Right, and we can um, use... Students with social media, maybe they want an internship, they want to learn how to do this sort of thing. Right. Um, public relations, I mean Paul, right? Yeah, we have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul is, a, yeah. Um, and then really just, just the actual planning of the campaign and the rewards. And here's, here's an interesting thing. As a university, you guys have a lot of resources that could potentially entice people to donate, even if it's not out of the goodness of their heart and they want some sort of reward. You guys will probably get donors just to donate because it's a great cause and you're the university. But like, think, think of potential rewards that either the faculty can offer or the students can offer. Um, rewards don't have to be tangible. Rewards can be a service. Um, Maybe someone's written a book. I think you've written a book, right, Chris? Okay. Maybe someone's written a book. That could be, the, these type of things could be rewards. How about if we sold subscriptions and the people, you know, sort of like PBS, where they would buy a membership and then they would be entitled to come to lectures for free or you know, some of the things that we charge for for free? Absolutely. The, uh, the Kiwanis Club of Danbury, I, I spoke in front of them, and they, they're doing like an ad book. Mm -hmm. So, but they only have a sheet of paper that, that they use and they have to be in, in person. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't you just add those to the rewards and do it online so you don't have to be in front of people all the time. Mm -hmm. they, they, they ask them to send the logos through the internet anyway, so now you get the crowdfunding campaign, they buy the thing there, the email goes to the email account, you just say, thanks for buying, keep 